back to another session of GAN Current Interface and News Analysis. So let us look into today's topics. We have 15th BRIC Summit, it's in detail. I took it in last class, but we have some detailed articles regarding it. Handbook on Combating Gender uh, Stereotypes, there are some updates regarding it as well. Then Turmeric Supplements in Medicine, NAMO 108, uh, and a megalithic site, Ajnala Masakar, 40 percentage duty on onion exports, and a white belly seagull, sea eagle. So let's look into 15th BRICS Summit. As I've told you, it's happening in uh, South Africa at Johannesburg. The problem here is that it's not a problem, but what I'm saying is that, like uh, previously when the BRICS organization was created, like the other Western nations and the big dialogue countries, like felt that this is just a regional organization with, big, uh, with some developing countries. But presently, with BRICS is turning into a major emerging economy to China, India, South Africa, Brazil, and Russia are such big economies and China being the world's second largest economy and India being the fifth largest economy. And thus, with the BRICS summit going on, all the world leaders and the Western countries are looking onto its outcome. So why is the 15th BRICS summit this important? Now you see, after COVID and the on, ongoing Ukraine-Russia war for the past four years, uh, the summit has been virtual. Now after four years, is the first in-person virtual summit that is happening. So like all the four countries like the Brazil, India, China and South Africa will be attending whereas Russia will be attending it virtually as I have already stated that South Africa is a member of the International Criminal Court so the, who has released actually a warrant for the Putin's arrest. So Putin's if visit South Africa then they will be bound to arrest Putin so he will be actually addressing it virtually. Now there is a first summit also with the Brazilian president, the new pre he was Brazilian president Lula will have returned to power who is actually a socialist and anti-western politics. So we are looking into a more emerging BRICS, BRICS. apart from all the five BRICS, uh, five big countries participation, South Africa has also invited African Union which consists of 55 members from Af Africa and also the other countries uh, which goes in the global south. So all the summit will be happening sidelines along with the BRICS. This message forms an invitation, a clear bridge for the development of Global South. So there is Global North and then there is Global South. Global South consists of the developing and emerging countries like India, South Africa and other countries as such. Whereas Global North is a very developed countries, America, European Union, Japan as such. So that is what is Global North and Global South is. So the also South Africa has also pushed an initiative for the development of Global South. Now what is it in for India? So if you are seeing here, this is also the first in-person uh, in submit where our President Narendra Modi and the Chinese President Xi Jinping will come face to face. Not, this is not the first, they have actually come face to face in the SEO summit, uh, SEO summit and the G20 Bali summit as such. But problem here is that this is a, a smaller talk where only four people are meeting so we can actually see a lot of bilateral uh, agreements and relations coming between India and China. So it's the ongoing 19th round of talk uh, regarding our LAC borderline of actual control area where there is a military standard between India and China, we can also see a resolution in this issue. Now presently about 1 lakh soldiers are standard in the LAC border area. And also after this two week, uh, breaks, two weeks we will be hosting the G20 summit. So we have to ensure the participation of the, all the global leaders, these BRICS leaders will also be there in the G20 summit. India also wants more cooperation from China and Russia that are blocking the discussions on common language for the leaders submit. So this is written for India. So one of the bigger items on the agenda, there will be a BRICS Africa outreach program and a BRICS plus dialogue with other countries as I have told you from African Union and Global South. And we are also looking for a major expansion of, expansion of the BRICS summit. As you see, BRICS was actually BRICS initially. South Africa came in 2010. 2010, that was the only latest addition, 2010, South Africa. Now we are looking into major economies being, uh, being like we can witness many other expansions in BRICS, if you, there are like four, four countries who can actually be added in this summit or next year summit namely Argentina, Saudi Arabia, Iran and UAE. So these are the four potential uh, members who could be added to the BRICS, uh, BRICS organization. Not only these four members but a lot of countries have shown interest in joining BRICS, like there are 14 countries who have shown interest in joining BRICS and 19 of them has already applied for the membership of 
BRICS. Now the BRICS is comparatively an alternative, alternative attractive option other than the G7 club for coming emerging countries as such. So what are else we can actually be expected to discuss on this? So there is intra trading blocks and BRICS currency emerging because they want to de dollarize and increase the use of local currency systems and reducing the use of US dollars. So there is a push towards BRICS currencies and also Johannesburg declaration as such. The South Africa has chosen a theme like the BRICS and Africa partnership for uh, mutually accelerated growth, sustainable development and inclusive multilateralism. So these actually seek to introduce initiative and its priority areas namely women development, also climate change, African continental free trade agreements. So these are some of the agreements that come along with what Africa wants to push in this big summit. Also China is looking to push its new global development initiative which is connected with the uh, broader objective of BRI, BRI goals and economic roadmap. Roadmap. So China has not just been pushing this in the BRICS but also has pushed this in uh, the Shanghai Cooperation Organization. So India fears that China is pushing a lot of initiative which is not actually very beneficial for India in the summit like BRICS. So that is a whole glimpse of what this article, uh, what this article meant on BRICS. Now moving forward we have the handbook on combating gender stereotypes. So this has been actually hand, uh, written by the present Chief Justice of India D.Y. Chandrachur and this, ha this book actually looks into all the stereotypes that women are claimed to be presently in this patriarchal society that we live in. So it contains a glossary of gender just terms like there are a lot of stereotypical terms uh, used in a patriarchal society in India. So the terms that should be used, a gender specific, gender unjust terms that has been used should be used is also mentioned in this handbook. What are some of the changes? So if you are looking into for example a term like adultery, this adultery is used specifically for a woman who has actually had sexual intercourse or sexual relationships outside a marriage. But this adultery clearly focuses on a woman and not a man. That a woman has lured a man out of his marriage to commit a sexual inter uh, relations outside his marriage. So this particular term has to be removed and this, um, the, spring, the handbook states that this adulterous word has to be uh, renamed as woman who has engaged in a sexual relationship outside of marriage. So this term adulterous should not be used anymore. And also the prefix like chaste or obedient like it's a uh, the a woman is pure or my wife is an obedient wife. So C such as prefix such as chaste and obedient should be removed and a lady should be just referred as a woman or a wife. No other prefix should be used before it. And also women has been actually told that they are very overly emotional, illogical and they can't take a proper decision. So the handbook also states that the reality is that a person's gender does not determine or influence their capacity for a rational thought. Also some terms like uh, housewife should not be used and uh, terms like how homemaker should be used. A homemaker which is more gender neutral should be used. Also assumptions about women's character based on the clothing or sexual history. Now this both can actually make, uh, the, there has been a lot of judgment based on this because, because of this woman's character on the clothing and the sexual history, lot of biased judges ha, judgments has been made in the past. So to reduce that, these kind of like where the personal life of a woman is portrayed, these kind of characters on the clothes they wear or sexual history should be avoided because that actually diminish the importance of consent in a sexual relationships. So this has been some of the key highlights that has been mentioned in the handbook. So how should a sexual violence be looked at? That is also mentioned in the handbook. A person who has gone through a sexual violence should be referred to as a victim or a survivor. No other hand, no other terminology should be used to mention such a person. The guidelines also point that clothing or the attire of the woman, ha woman ha should be independent. Like that, these kind of clothing and attire should not come into the in between the judgment. And also a man who touches a woman without her consent, but he states in his defense that the clothing or attire of the woman actually draws him invited his turn. So such statement in his defense should also not be used or not should not should not be also considered in the case of a judgment. The handbooks actually mentions a lot of do's and don'ts and how to handle issues of rape and assault. And also it takes like a lot of, like to report a sexual violence it takes up a lot of courage. So women 
actually take a long time to me even come out and report such kind of assault and sexual offense. So that should be also taken into consider and these kind of cases should not uh, should not be taken out by not uh, not actually not taking any FIR cases and such. So that kind of cases even if the woman actually comes and reports it after years that case should be taken and considered because it takes up a lot of courage to come forward. We have actually seen in recent news like in the past few years we have seen the Me Too movement where women are coming out of their uh, coming out and getting the courage to speak about the rape and the sexual offenses that has been happening to them. So it takes a lot of time and a lot of courage. So such cases if it happens if reported late also should be considered. This is also stated in the handbook. Now there are some judgments like judgment which has actually rejected this kind of stereotype in the past. If you are looking the Joseph Shine versus the Union of India, the term adulteress ha, uh, which has been adultery which has been mentioned in section 497 of the Indian Penal Code has been removed. It states that a woman, the society ascribes impossible virtues to a woman and confines her to a narrow sphere of behavior by expectation of conformity. This is what the Supreme Court has stated that a woman are confined to some of the stereotypes because of which the term adultery is very negatively referred to in case of a woman. So such a term from the section 497 of the IPC has been removed from under this Joshavi Shine case. So if you are looking into other cases like the state of Jharkhand versus the Shalindra Kumar Rai case where the two finger test in the case of a rape survivor has also been Ban. Now this affects the uh, dignity of the woman, other victims and survivors. In the state of Punjab versus the Gurmi Singh, it states that the testimony of a safe survivor or victim inherently credible. Like even if the person has actually lodged a case after years of happening, the, uh, happening such a crime, that will also be valid. That is what in state of Pancha versus Gurmi Singh case talks about. So these are some of the previous judgments that the Supreme Court has made regarding to the rejection of stereotype that exist in a patriarchal society. So these are some of the cases. If you are looking at the entire article, this is actually regarding to a social justice. You can actually mention this in women how there is a development of women by introducing such a handbook of term, terminology and uh, how we can actually reduce such stereotypes which are happening in India. These are some of the important cases which you can actually mention in your main answers as well. Now moving on, we have a very small article called the Turmeric Supplements in Medicine. So recently in Australia, there has been a, a 18 cases reported where the patients have shown liver infections and liver injuries because the medicines which they were consuming had turmeric, like turmeric or active in ingredients of curc curc curcumin. So that is what has been in use. So the Australian Therapy Goods Administrator TAG who actually countries regulates the medicine imports and exports he actually told that the people who already has liver infections or previous with previous liver problem should not consume such kind of medicines which has turmeric but for consumption usage like usually we have we have in our consumption the risk of liver injury doesn't come like in a daily like it's a staple food in south and southeast asia so as a staple food, you can actually use a little bit of turmeric that has been prescribed. But in case of medication and people with a liver problems and such, such medicines which consist of uh, uh, traces of uh, turmeric in a large dose should be avoided. The, in Australia, about 600 listed medicines have actually the presence of such uh, turmeric, turmeric and its active ingredients. So turmeric has a lot of health benefits as I have told you turmeric is actually used in staple foods in South, Southeast, Southeast Asia. It is actually used in Ayurveda in India and also Chinese medicines. It is, it has antioxidant properties which can actually help in inflammation. So these include uh, arthritis and infections. So these can, these are actually included in medicines as such. So it, have, it is also used in a drug called Artemisis which is actually used in the treatment of malaria and it's very effective. The, in studies also the investigation of drugs is happening and now this has been tested in mice, mice but the human trials are still pending. So turmeric does have a lot of health benefits but there is some reaction happening to people who already have a liver problem and this is not just Australia which has, uh, which has actually reported but a country uh, France had also some cases where uh, uh, hepatitis was actually caused uh, to some 15 to 8 20 persons who actually was related to the consumption of food supplements containing 
turmeric. So that is what is has been actually in moose. In some research, they also found that the turmeric actually causes choleritic prop, uh, properties, which means that it stimulates the secretion of bile for further digestion of women. But people who already have bile duct diseases should not consume this. Also, now this cumin or turmeric actually reacts with other medications and interacts with other medications like the cancer treatment drugs, immunosuppressants, uh, as such. So, so there is also health benefits in the case of using turmeric and a lot of negatives in using turmeric for people who is already taking other medications or has problems with bile ducts and such there has been a safety limit which has been mentioned the european food agency has actually said acceptable daily intake of about 180 milligram for a person who is 60 kg who stated that 3 milligram per kg uh, per kg for the consumption so if i am 50 kg is uh, 50 kg i should be consuming 3 into 50 that is 150 kg if i am 60 3 into 60 that is 180 milligram should be consumed as a daily dosage daily that is a safety limit that has been mentioned so this is all has been in turmeric there is health benefits there is actually not health benefits there are safety limits which has been prescribed for the consumption of turmeric now moving on we have namo 180 now namo 180 is actually a lotus species which has been recently discovered and this namo 180 is only present in manipur now recently scientists came to know that 108 petals are present in this uh, variety of lotus and they state that this has a religious significance to Hinduism. So you see here, this is the Namo 108. But comparing this Namo 108 with other species of lotus flowers we have in India, this species had less fiber, so it could not be used for other purposes. And there was fiber quality of this Namo 108 was very less. So what the scientists did that they actually genetically modified this kind of variety to increase its fiber content so that this flower could be used for other purposes other purpose like in use of perfumes as such and now in India this is the only the Damo 108 is the only lotus variety that has been genetically modified or genome sequenced in India. Now they have also pushed this lotus mission inside with the horticulture missions so that this variety of flowers will be grown all over India and not would not be just restricted to Manipur alone. So that is what is in use in regarding Namo 108. Moving on, we have a megalithic ex uh, excavation site in Kerala. It is the Nagaparamba excavation. So, you will see here this picture. This is the excavation site that is in Kerala. This is in Man Ma Malapuram district in Kerala, in the Nagaparamba site in Kuttipuram village near Thiru Thirunavaya in Malapuram district in Kerala. Now, a lot of headstones, like megalithic headstones, called the Topikalu in Malayalam. It's called Topikalu in Malayalam. So that has been actually found. Hard stones has been found in this area. Now these hard stones are actually hemisphere, laterine stone. Now this is actually used to close burial urns. In the previous megalithic sites, the bodies has been actually buried in the burial urns and then digged into the ground. So this hard stone has been used to cover that lid of burial urn. So such a hard stones called the Topikalu has been found in Kerala in this Nagaparambas excavation site so this was the large this site hold the largest number of such hard stones and is an unprotected site in india now the people were laying actually waterworks or pipelines there when they cut suddenly came across rock cut laterite burial chambers that is what is seen here that is a this is a rock cut laterite burial chamber that is similar not found in kerala but this is what a lateral burial chamber looks like so along with this, a lot of megalithic burial sites and relics were also found. And the teen salvage numerous and other earthen urns, iron implements were also found and this was dated back close to 2000 years ago. So remember this excavation, it is important for especially for students who are history optionals and this is also important for films as such. Moving on, we have another issue called Ajnala Massacre. So, Ajnala is a place in Punjab. It is actually beneath the old Gurudwara Sikh Sabha in Ajnala near Amritsar. This is actually about 40 kilometers away from the Indo-Pakistan border area. So in 2014, in 28 February 2014, a group of historians, archaeologists along with this, they had just image of how, image of the site. So they actually traced out the actual location and went to find the site of massacre. Now, 
when they reached the site they found that they had to dig a lot into it it was hidden in a well about 282 soldiers bodies were actually buried in this well for about 157 years so doing with the dna analysis they came to know that they were young soldiers who were actually present in the 26 native bengal infantry now this was during the 1857 revolt now these were also called the 1857 Kalyanwala Martyrs Well. So that is what the uh, Ajnala massacre is actually called the 1857 Kalyanwala Martyrs Well. In this they have actually came to found the bodies of 282 young Indian soldiers who were taking part in the 1857 revolt against the East India Company, uh, British East India Company. And they had actually come across the Ravi to Ajnala <coughs> to counter the British during the 1857 uprising. Now they were shorted and actually was buried in this well. So like when you bury someone there has to be some smell. So the British what they did that to ensure that no foul smell comes, they actually buried the bodies and then they covered it with covered it with coal and lime so that the foul smell does not escape. Now if you are looking in the pattern the 282 soldiers body was not actually buried but they were actually dumped into the well from a height. So that is why the hole there is actually a collapse of this whole structure in it. Looking at the condition of the skeletal remains, we can now establish that the bodies were thrown from a certain height into the well instead of burying them. Burying them. The latest DNA technologies have actually allowed us to confirm that there was human refines, human refi remains of the Ajnala well was actually the young Indian soldiers who was belonging to the 1857 revolt. Further DNA research analysis and tests are actually happening still now. Coins, bullets and such has actually been, coins, bullets and such has actually been found from the side from along with this skeleton. So that is Ajnala massacre. This is state equal to that of a Jalinwala Bat massacre. One of the gruesome issues and that what happened in 1857 which Indians we didn't know until 2003-2014. So that is the issue. Now moving on we have increase in duty in onion export. So coming festival season we have the onam Diwali, everything coming up. So with the ongoing uh, season of festivals there is an increase in flowers, onion, tries in the flowers, onion, tomatoes as such. So there is a lot of demand for onion right now but the supply is not matching the onion, the demand for the onion. So they have, the central government has actually increased the duty about 40% duty uh, for the exports of onion in India. About 9.75 lakh tons of onion have been exported, exported annually and the major importers of these onions are Bangladesh, Malaysia and UAE. This is a very small article, things which you need to know. Moving on to the last topic, we have the white bellied sea eagle who are also named as raptors. Now these are actually least concerned in the case of IUCN because these are seen all along the coastal areas in South and Southeast Asia. Now they actually build their nest in trees now because there is no trees available in the coastal area due to a lot of deforestation and such they are actually constructing their nest in power lines all near to the coastal region areas. They mainly feed on sea snakes and fish and these they are aggressive hunters so they are also nicknamed as raptors. It occupies the same localities for years and they generally build nests in tall trees near this ecos, tidal creeks and estuaries. This is a very small article. You need to know white bellied sea eagle, it's in use, it's an aggressive predator, it's just nicknamed as raptors. It feeds on sea snakes and fish. It's a least concern because it's locally available in all, all the coastal areas in South and Southeast Asia. Even we can find these in inland waterways, inland water areas. So that is it for today. This was a very small article. You can get the PDF from our telegram channel Galand IAS official. Thank you and have a nice day. I will be seeing you again you tomorrow. Thank you.